I've already introduced the crew, but here we are again suiting up. There's Bob. Uh, these suits are uncomfortable but necessary, and we're used to them now. We have some terrific folks that maintain them for us and make sure they fit us right, and we've gotten pretty used to wearing them. You just saw Rich, there's Jim, and of course Guy. And as we walk out, I'll hand it over to Bob to let him talk a little bit about the Ascend evolution. Yeah, for those that can't read that uh, very well, that said Beat Army. Unfortunately, uh, all my uh, efforts to cheer the midshipmen on uh, came to no avail as the Navy ended up losing the game. We uh, got out on the pad and we ended up sitting for about an hour and a half uh, after our initial launch time due to ice on the uh, vehicle. So we had to wait for the sun to come up and uh, warm things up a little bit. And then it was a, a little bit of a race to see whether the sun could melt everything off before the clouds moved in and prevented us from going. But fortunately, it, everything came together all at once, and uh, we were able to get off uh, on launch day. This was my second flight aboard uh, Discovery, and I don't care uh, how many times you've flown on a space shuttle. It's a pretty spectacular experience when those solids light off and uh, you start going uphill. Here you can see our rollover to... Uh, 57 degree inclination insertion. Uh, Discovery, as Dave mentioned, it was uh, just a fantastic vehicle considering that it was the first flight after major mod and all the work that was done on it. It, uh, it was like brand new and it performed exceptionally well. As you all know, the solids burn for about uh, two minutes, uh, then they separate. Here's a nice shot of the uh, turn to flying up the East Coast. Once we uh, get off the solids, it's another six and a half minutes to our uh, orbital velocity, 17,500 miles an hour. And then once uh, we get to MECO, uh, it was time to set up shop on orbit and get DOD-1 deployed, and I'll let Guy talk a little. This is, this is a shot of inside the cockpit as we uh, got ready for on-orbit activities. Once we got on orbit, the uh, initial activity was to prepare the deployment of DOD-1, which went uh, very successfully. And then once we got uh, DOD-1 deployed, then we uh, set up for our secondary uh, experiments and uh, prepared to do that for the next uh, six days. Each day we change out some lithium hydroxide canisters on board the shuttle to keep our atmosphere clean. And as I was preparing to do that on a, our first morning, I found out we had a stowaway on board. Uh, as you may have heard, we had a training team that was called the Bad Dog Training Team, and we became, because of that, the dog crew, each of us having dog names and uh, having a lot of fun with that during our training. And we thought we'd left that behind when we launched, but sure enough, we came up with this stowaway who had the uh, unfortunate fate of having the worst dog name of all, and that was Dog Breath. But we did have some fun with that while we were in space as well. It made for a few light moments. And Dog Breath watched over us throughout our flight and made sure that we did a good job. We're going to walk you through some of the secondaries that we did on the, uh, the orbit. Uh, here you see some pictures of Dave Walker and myself operating the BLAST experiment, uh, which is the Battlefield Laser Acquisition Sensor Test. You see uh, in the overhead window there, Dave's holding the optical mm -hmm. head assembly, which uh, is supposed to sense a ground-based low-power laser, with a, which has a data stream embedded in it. The purpose of the experiment was to, one, acquire the laser, and two, interpret the data stream. Uh, we had some success in that. Uh, it was uh, originally uh, forecast that we could just point it out the overhead windows. Uh, however, our orbiter attitude for other secondary experiments, which had a higher priority, uh, prevented us from uh, essentially crossing in the perpendicular of the ground-based laser. So we ended up having to point it, and uh, we did have some success in that. Here you see a guy working with a computer that was part of the Hercules experiment. Hercules was a handheld electronic still camera that was attached to an inertial measurement unit. It allowed us to combine the uh, ability to take photographs out the window with geolocating very precisely where those places were. We did alignments with the inertial measurement unit on stars, and then we took pictures of points on the ground and were able to locate them, uh, th they expected, within one to two nautical miles. They don't have the data back yet, but the preliminary look at them looks like they're very close to 
what they expected uh, within several nautical miles of, of the, uh, the actual site. Uh, this gives us a, a really great increase in capability with knowing what we're taking pictures of from space. And this is the camera and the inertial measurement unit that I'm holding after just taking a photograph of a point on the ground. This is a shot of a, uh, a volcano uh, that we took a picture of as we uh, flew around the Earth. Uh, we were up about uh, 160 miles when we flew by this crater, uh, which is uh, formerly in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the... This is also a shot of the coast uh, of the Soviet Union. This is the... Uh... Uh, glow cryo heat pipe experiment. This is the glow portion of it. This is the extreme UV uh, spectrometer. Uh, a little further aft on the bulkhead are the two cryo heat pipes in a, a canister, one built by TRW, the other by Hughes, that used liquid oxygen as the transport medium. The glow portion of the experiment, the uh, uh, UV spectrometer here, was taking a look at the interaction of the orbiter with the extreme thin atmosphere uh, in low Earth orbit. Uh, in doing so, it also it measured the spectrum as well as the density of the uh, interaction. And then we uh, also did uh, water dumps. Uh, here you can see a water dump out the uh, side port. Looks like a snowstorm in space, but the spectrometer was also taking a look at how this uh, debris interacts with the uh, environment around the orbiter. And additionally, uh, some RCS jet firings. Here you can see some primary jet firings uh, that it was also looking at. One of the few night passes. We had a really nice feature on board the vehicle, and that was a uh, PC and a modem. And you can see uh, me operating that uh, PC. Mm -hmm. We were able to send personal messages down to our families and the families were able to send personal messages up to us uh, each day as well as uh, the local news and uh, we could print off these messages, we could bring the messages up on the screen or print them out on a printer and you can see me uh, printing out a personal message that was sent up by uh, one of the family members. This was really a nice feature that we had to keep us up to date as to what was going on uh, while we were on orbit. Uh, this is one of the many medical DSOs that we uh, participated in. This one is uh, taking uh, retinal photography. I'm using a fundus camera to shoot a picture of uh, Rich's uh, retina. Then by uh, measuring the dilation of the blood vessels, taking a look at fluid shift within the body. Along with that, we also uh, numbed his eye here and used a tonal pen, a tonometer, to measure the uh, pressure within inside his eye. Uh, this was done uh, the first couple days in orbit and then at the end of the mission. And they're looking at how fluid shift within the body affects uh, space motion sickness, uh, as well as how we adapt to uh, a microgravity environment. You can tell who the rookie was on the flight. <laughs> no choice. Uh, another experiment that we flew was microcapsules in space. Uh, this was looking at uh, pharmaceutical uh, making uh, microcapsules or microspheres, 50 micron spheres, using ampicillin as the drug and uh, a biodegradable polymer uh, to encase it. Uh, we haven't got the total results back on the experiment yet, but uh, hopes are that they can produce these uh, microspheres that would be like time-released uh, uh, capsules for uh, antibiotics. This is another medical type experiment called the visual function tester. It was used to try to measure the changes in our visual performance in a space flight environment. Uh, we looked in the box and looked at uh, things that we'll show you here and tried to measure the changes in our contrast threshold, the directional perception, and pattern perceptions. So Dave and I would look into this each day for about 20 minutes and uh, do the test and try to see the differences in, try to see the differences in, in space. What you're seeing here is views of the fluid acquisition and resupply experiment FAIR. Uh, one of the most dynamic experiments we had on orbit and uh, truly for one of, the, uh, one of the special ones for a shuttle mission. Its uh, purpose is to develop new methods of transferring Earth storable liquids on orbit, uh, specifically for propellant tank design. Uh, when, you have start, when you have to start resupplying the space station with shuttle, you're going to have to try to get rid of all the fluid that you're bringing up there because weight to orbit is extremely expensive. 
and this is developing new methods and new procedures to transfer uh, those propellants and other liquids that uh, may need. Uh, what you see here is the uh, expulsion of a fluid. It's being drawn in through those two vein devices, uh, essentially uh, very minute screens, and uh, the bubbles are coalescing around the screen. Uh, another of the tests that we did on orbit uh, were uh, seeing the fluid motion. Uh, at this time, we're not draining the tank, but we're watching the motion of the fluid inside it during primary jet uh, firings, and you can see that the, the motion is rather dramatic. And one of the critical events is that you do not want gas to be ingested in the jet that you may be firing when you're, when you're expulsing fluid out of the propellant tank. So this is part of the test results are to determine, uh, one, better methods of uh, expulsing the tank, and two, of refilling it. And uh, we did uh, eight separate tests, uh, four of them with vented fills and four of them with evacuated fills. A rather successful test. Here's Bob using a relatively novel method of mounting our rowing machine. A large part of what we do on each space flight is to determine better ways to live and work in space, and we have determined that exercise is real important in giving you both physical and mental well-being and, of course, counteracting the deconditioning that goes on uh, even from the first day you get into space. Uh, dogs are a problem whether you're working out on the Earth or in space. As you saw, Bob was doing pretty much aerobic exercises there. This, this rowing machine is extremely versatile. We're real fond of it. I'm doing more of the, the strength exercises, demonstrating them. We, in fact, worked out an average of 30 minutes a day each on the machine in space from the fourth day through the end of the flight and found it very helpful. It really makes you feel good. Because of the lack of gravity, it's a lot more versatile than an ordinary rowing machine. As you can see, in addition to the actual rowing motion, you can do squats and presses, standing and, uh, and sitting and curls. It really makes for a, a excellent all-around exercise device, and we hope to have something similar to it, although probably a little more complex on space station. This is a shot of a, uh, of a sunrise and uh, on our orbit, or sunset, and uh, we had a unique flight in the sense that we never really had a complete sunset, and so our Rich never saw a complete sunset uh, in space. Uh, in this view, we are getting ready to come home, and uh, the pilot and commander have already climbed into their LESs in preparation for coming home. I've climbed into my LES, and in the preparation for coming home, we were uh, diverted one complete rev, so instead of landing at the Cape, uh, we were told to land at uh, Edwards because of weather. So we had to wave off uh, one complete mm -hmm. rev, and then uh, Rich, uh, shown in this shot, and then Jim, later on uh, climbed into their LESs in preparation for coming home. So this is uh, the guys up in the cockpit uh, getting set to uh, ride the vehicle home from uh, 160 nautical miles. Here's the very end of that operation. I might mention that we did have, I think, the record cross range we've ever had in the orbiter. It made for a, a continuous right descending turn coming down from the north end Edwards Air Force Base. When we got there, the weather turned out to be not quite as good, at least right over the runway, as we had hoped. We wound up with a ceiling at about 4,000 feet. Uh, it didn't cause any problems in making the landing, but we, we do feel we've logged the first instrument approach, if you will, in the space shuttle. Uh, all the navigation devices worked just as advertised, and it was a piece of cake to fly. There's a little crosswind here, which you'll be able to see uh, perhaps, if you look carefully, in some, some small right wing down inputs as I get close to the ground here. Bob does a great job of keeping me straight and advising me, helping me with the approach and getting the gear down, which is a real career limiter if you don't do it. There you see the touchdown. Because we had a crosswind that was within the limits to do so, we we're going to deploy the drag chute here. Uh, the drag chute worked extremely well. The handling qualities with the drag chute were as good as we could have hoped. And even though, as you can see from the crosswind, it did tend to veer out to the left of the uh, orbiter, it didn't cause any difficulty in the, in the handling during the rollout, which is good news because we, we're counting on this drag chute to improve our rollout margins uh, in the future. And of course, it's an, excellent, it's an excellent device for that. Really enjoyed the landing. Uh, we, we were happy to be home. We'd been in the suits a long time, and we were ready to get out of them. As it turns out, we didn't get out of them quite as quickly as we might have hoped. But other than that, it was a, a nearly perfect flight, and we had a great time. <laughs>